Hello, explorers. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 160 of the podcast. It's the 22nd of January, 2019, as I record this intro. So my guest this week is Kirsten Fredericks. She and her husband, Carl, have three boys, now young adults, who pretty much grew up unschooling. We have a wonderful conversation touching on how she found unschooling, the most challenging aspect of de-schooling for her, supporting our children's passions, moving from control to trust, what surprised her most about how unschooling has unfolded in their lives, and so much more. As a personal update, we are just coming out of a cold snap here with the wind chills that were down around minus 30 Celsius. So today's minus 10 feels practically balmy. (laughs) And as for inside, I've been really appreciating the routine of things right now. It feels comfortable in that good way, like, like wearing a favorite sweater. Now, before we get to my conversation with Kirsten, I just want to take a moment to thank everyone who has chosen to support my unschooling work through Patreon. Uh, A big welcome to new patrons, Katie Ryan and Kara Nelson. Hi, thanks guys. I deeply appreciate all my patrons. Their generous support is vital to helping me freely share information and inspiration with anyone who's curious and wants to explore the fascinating world of unschooling. If you'd like to support my unschooling work like this podcast and my website, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash exploring unschooling. And now let's get to my conversation with Kirsten. Welcome. I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca and today I'm here with Kirsten Fredericks. Hi, Kirsten. Hey, Pam. Hey. Just a little introduction. I've known Kirsten for many, many years, first online and then in person through lots of unschooling conferences and gatherings over the years. Her children are now all young adults, and I'm thrilled that she agreed to join me to answer 10 questions about her unschooling experience. So to get us started, can you share with us a bit about you and your family? Well, um, let's see. So my husband and I, my husband's name is Carl, and I have uh, three boys, Skylar, Eric, and Sawyer. Uh, My nephew also lives with us at this time for like, I think the last four or five years. Um, so in their ages, Skylar is 22, Eric's 21, and Sawyer is 19. Uh, we live on a farm in upstate New York, and this is it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, so we raise, uh, beef, cattle, and pigs for pork and it's just a small family farm and my husband also does construction work i know i'm talking about like what we do but um and and i wear like five million hats yeah so <laughs> absolutely Not that's literally. all yeah exactly yeah, literally especially in this <laughs> weather right <laughs> <laughs> so what did your family's move to unschooling like like how did you discover it and how did that move go well, um, we started, we did start out in public schools. Um, I had, abs- I had never even questioned the concept of public school, thought it was the thing to do. Both my parents were public school teachers. I went to college to become a public school teacher. Oh. <laughs> um, ne- never really questioned it, you know, questioned some teaching philosophies within, like within the structure of school, but not, um, not school entirely. <laughs> so um, also did not know any homeschoolers. And starting in first grade, my oldest Skylar was struggling a lot. Um, basically with, I mean, there, it, it gets complicated, but the, I would say that the big thing was dealing with transitions, mm-hmm. um, having to stop what he was in the middle of doing and move on to something else um and it would just it it was resulting in multiple meltdowns um 
you know, basically I was on call at all times while they were in school. Yeah. And, you know, uh, it, it was, it was pretty awful. We spent two years. That's how long it took me. I was fighting the whole idea of homeschooling because in my head at the time, I thought it was something just weird. So fringe that I would, it's not something I would ever do. Um, and I really thought I could change the school system to fit Skylar. <laughs> and, uh, that didn't work and it took me two years to really get that driven in um but the summer before he went into third grade i started meeting some homeschoolers in the area and telling myself okay well this is my last resort because i don't want to put them in a a you know a, a special school where they <laughs> they were talking about you know their restraint systems and things like that um and i just started kind of that summer treating it as if i was homeschooling um to the best of my concept of what that would look like and for us because i felt that keeping everything as fun as possible was the easiest way to do this and the fewer you know, fewer battles. Um, that looked like just going places, um, tons of field trips, uh, which, you know, it's funny, I don't use the term anymore. At the time, field trip was like, oh, you mean going out into the real world? <laughs> <laughs> but like, like oh, <laughs> like it, it, it's so funny to think of how, like, then, you know, you would describe it as a field trip, something yeah. separate from from school and or separate from learning or I don't even know what it would be but um and I did kind of encourage them to keep journals and there there was definitely a certain amount of like measuring going on that would not be considered unschooling um and anyway Skylar ran away from school I think the second week of third grade um and he was heading home <laughs> and so yeah it wasn't funny at the time but yeah. um yeah but that was that was a friday and i said i'm keeping him home and then the other two said well if he's staying home why can't we and it was like okay here we go <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so it started out mostly as like okay let's just relax from this perpetual state of crisis we've been in um and try to you know calm down from that for starters mm -hmm. um so that was really for us that was the beginning of our de-schooling was just recovery <laughs> yeah um, yeah no i mean that sounds very familiar i i i went through that whole stage too you know of of working with the teachers and thinking you know, and, and, you know, and, and they were trying to, for the most part, yes. you know, it was so dependent on what teacher you got too, right? Um, it it, it was, everyone was trying very hard, but it was as if certain perspectives were so in, in ground. And I think, mm -hmm. like, and I understand that, um, but I just couldn't get through on, yeah. on a number of things. So yeah, no, <laughs> and it just wasn't um, wasn't worth. The, I was going to say their soul, you know, because it really was about about breaking them to fit in. You know, that was right. ultimately what had to be done. And I, I mean, I remember the principal after I took him out. Like we tried a private school that last year because I still at this point had never even heard of homeschooling yet, right? Okay, wow. And, yeah. and the principal had said to me later because my other two kids were still at that school, so I still saw her, and she's and she was like, "It's great that you could do that because he just wasn't going to be. We weren't going to be able to help him here. You know, create an environment that was good for him here." You know, and then I found homeschooling because, you know, the other environment was better, but it still wasn't great. Right. Yeah. Um, right. You know, it, 
we, and yeah, we I mean, we go into all that background, but way. but yeah, you yeah. know, it was all there, there was this thing that moment. There was that moment where it's like, oh, okay, this this just isn't going to be. This just isn't going to work you know, and, and realizing that, oh, I guess we're here. And then needing that whole, you know, let's just relax and, and get through that crisis mode, really. Like it, it was like an extended crisis. Cause as you said, you're always on call waiting for when they were yep. going to call. That's why I ended up leaving work and staying home mm-hmm. even before I discovered homeschooling because it was just so much you know, yeah. getting the call at work or, or whatever. It's like, no, I need, I want to be, I want to be putting my time into this. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and I mean, that whole journey taught me so much and, and, you know, I, it was, it was necessary for us to take all those steps and break all those little barriers little by little, um, you know, understanding more and more what the kids needed, what we needed just learning to question things and it and learning to question authority and mm-hmm. start trusting yeah. my my own gut feeling and trusting my kids and that's <laughs> that trust it's the you know it's been the best thing and the hardest thing yeah, no, exactly. I mean, all these are, are, are such important steps for us uh, on, on our journey, right? You know, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. So once you guys were home, you had a little bit of time to kind of um, move past some of that trauma and stress that was built out of that. Over the next, yeah. you know, couple of years, as you were doing kind of the bulk of your de-schooling, what yeah. did you find to be kind of the most challenging aspect of that, do you think? Um, I think I continued to struggle to let go of some um, really strong opinions I had <laughs> about things like TV and video games and um, screen time in general to, to broaden that out. Um, mm-hmm. I had... Also, I think it, it took a while to get rid of um, having kind of schooly ideas of what had value and what didn't have value. Mm-hmm. What, you know, what, you know, categorizing, well, this is, this is play time and this is learning time um, and not understanding that it was happening <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> you know um so those things and also I, a lot of it for me because we had been in the school system so all our friends um I, I again I did not know a lot of homeschoolers and I didn't even when I started reaching out to a wider online community I did not know a lot of them um locally and in mm-hmm. person and that and anyways um so I didn't I felt a little bit like I was inventing the wheel when I definitely was not. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, it just took a while to realize all the resources that were out there. um, Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, there was another point there that I was trying to make about, you know, um, that, oh, and and, uh, worrying what other people thought. Um, My mother lived with us at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and she is a passionate public school teacher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she had, she loved school. She loved being in school. She loved being a student. She loved the whole structure of it. The, all these things worked great for her. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I found myself feeling kind of supervised or judged. Um, and, and some of that came from myself. And, um, so that, that was challenging for yeah. sure, to just be like, okay, no, I'm, 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 I'm going to do this and I'm going to try not to worry what you think of me. Um, this, was that like line. a conversation that you had with her over time? Cause I know a few people have found yeah. themselves in that situation and they're, I bet they're curious. I'm certain that 
did, I mean, at this moment, because we're talking um, a long time <laughs> ago now. Um, yeah, so I'm sure that we had yeah. the conversation in bits and pieces multiple times. <laughs> um, and the, the interesting thing, even though, you know, she still loves um, her methods of teaching and all of that, but she... Um, she was in her last few years of teaching at that time, and she ended up retiring early, uh, largely because the spectrum within the public schools had gone so far to standardized testing, like everything, so that mm -hmm. teaching to the test, um, and that was not her, her method. And she was just watching us doing what we were doing and seeing the benefits. And so in a lot of ways, she, she gave up, you know, chose to retire early because she couldn't deal with it anymore. And mm -hmm. she was fully aware that she couldn't bring some of these ideas into the school system at that point. So. Mm -hmm. No, that's so interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think <laughs> we... I was worried about her judgment, but in in a lot of ways that, you know, she just learned so much from it. So, and, and it's amazing when we look back and we realize how much of it was our journey to take, right? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Cause when you're, when you're in the thick of it, um, especially near the beginning, it feels like, you know, we, we want to be educating others and, and getting them to see our point of view and trying to convince yeah. them. And then later we realized we were kind of trying to convince them because it was part of convincing us because it's like it, if we it, could get someone right. else to agree and understand, then it was a little less responsibility for us to take on. Like yeah. you were saying before, right? How we feel like we're inventing this wheel and we're going against everything. Yeah, and, and it was a huge weight of responsibility, just this thought that, uh, wow, now I am in charge of, yeah. of you know, everything. basically, <laughs> everything, not just their, you know, preschool formative years, but their entire schooling formative years, and yeah, yeah, it, it was a scary, yeah. scary thing to, to yeah. So along this way, as you were working through all the stuff and with your mom, <laughs> um, I'd like to hear a little bit about uh, your husband's journey and how, how you kind of worked through that was, uh, you know, how did you help him learn what you were learning and, and, and how did he um, come along for the ride? <laughs> well, I mean, he, he had he was a first-hand witness to the struggles that we were dealing with with public school so mm -hmm. there was no need to convince him that that was not working yeah um so that was very clear to him you know and he could immediately see that his children were happier and at first that was really all that freaking mattered to us at all <laughs> yep yep um that, that that was pretty much everything um and i think you know i think he had concerns about my abilities and to teach because at the, in the beginning we were still thinking homeschool not unschool yeah. um and but I think the fact that I had a degree in teaching um like kind of pacified him there a bit and when he was witnessing the amount of research I was doing and throwing myself into it um I think that helped a lot too um he also struggled a great deal in school mm -hmm. and so he could relate to what was wrong with school to an extent. Yeah. Um, you know, um, so I think the hardest part was, you know, some of the doubts, some of that need to be like, well, shouldn't, shouldn't they be doing X, Y, Z by now? Yeah. Or what did you do today? we were both, you know, separating what, what did you do today that was learning? <laughs> yep. <laughs> what, what if this had value? I mean, we weren't really using those. 
Okay, that was a call. Did that mess things up? No, no, I just that's good. It. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You guys were still separating um, out what was learning from what other things that you were doing. You're still looking for learning to kind of look the way you were expecting it through through schoolish eyes, right? Yes. And he, you know, he would be working all day and I'd be home. And I think what was hard for me was to translate the the moments that I felt almost could only be understood by witnessing them. Yeah. Um, some, it was it was hard to translate that into some sort of um, you know like report of what our kids learned today and what progress was made or anything like that. And um, so there, you know, even as a couple, we had to come to this "I need you to trust me" point. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing the things going better and better and better. And I would keep t sharing things about unschooling because as I was discovering that, that was becoming like more and more the direction I was going and uh, realizing how right it felt. Yeah. So, yeah. Batteries at 20%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah, but no, he, I, I feel like he struggled with it a little bit more, but mostly because he was having to trust that I was handling it and not able to witness it every day. You yeah. Know? Um, and also he wasn't doing the reading. He wasn't doing the research. So I was sharing it with him. And again, that became, you know, trusting me to, to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, but I think. He definitely, you know, reached the point where he was able to see the differences in how his kids were handling things and how other people's kids were handling things. And um, not in like, oh, this kid is smarter or this kid is more advanced, but just happier. Yeah. Um, yeah. Those, yeah. Those just, the hugest thing. Yeah. Just the way they approach their, their days. Yeah, I think they just yeah. they just eventually gain they gain more experience um just being with their their kids and and as they get older like you said you kind of see it's not like it's as you mentioned it's not a comparison of of smart or or not smart smarter any of that kind of stuff it's just really I think um how they approach their days the their attitude even just you know their excitement with life yeah. in general right the amount of self motivation there is, yeah, and the, their understanding of themselves and what they love and what they don't love and what they want to do and what they don't want to do, and um, virtually, I mean, in comparison to what I went through, I I feel like they're practically you know peer pressure proof. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that's a great way to put it. <laughs> Yeah, um, and, and I don't think that that's necessarily true for every child who's unschooled, um, no. you know, mm -hmm. but um, so I'm not saying that's completely about that's unschooling, but it, but it, it also sure helped. Yeah, I was going to say, it helps, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's no guarantees. We're all individuals, right? But in general, that is... It's, it's been a help because they're given that time and the support to um, make their own choices, learn from their choices, become to, to become more self-aware just by the fact that they're making choices, right? Because if you have um, the openness or responsibility to make those choices, you're going to want to make good ones for yourself, right? So it's like, oh, do I want to do? You're going to ask yourself those questions that a lot of other kids don't get the opportunity to ask themselves. They only just are expected to do what they're told to do, right? Rather than figuring out for themselves what they'd like to do. Yep. yep. Absolutely. <laughs> and just to mention that we 
did a little quick change and now Kirsten's inside and hopefully this will work a little bit better because <laughs> now she's plugged in, which is awesome. So we will go to the next question there. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I've known you for many years and I've loved watching how you dive in to fully support your children's diverse interests and their passions. And as I thought about it over the years, I think that's something um, that parents can sometimes struggle with, that if their child is passionate about something, that they need to really encourage their child to take care of all aspects of it from the get-go, or else they're really not as passionate as they say about it. Like, they feel like it's a moment they need to teach them responsibility, right? That if you really want yeah. this thing, you, you need to um, take care of all aspects of it. And that hasn't really been my experience over the years. And I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Okay. Well, I think, I mean, I agree that we, that it's, well, first of all, even like the word passion, which I use a lot, mm -hmm. um, but I don't know if I use it the same way that some other people do, because I feel like passions can be very temporary. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I, what I found with my kids uh, a good amount of the time is that they would jump from passion to passion. Um, and I don't think this was really where the question was going, but That's okay. Take it. <laughs> <laughs> you go. But, okay. Yeah. So I guess like for, for me, the way I saw it was that it was truly my job, um, to, help facilitate what their interests were. And as an unschooling mom, if, if I was ascribing to this belief that the learning is where their, their joy is and the learning is where the, their interests are, um, that, that was, that was right there. They just set the curriculum for me, even though, you know, I was still thinking in those terms. Too. Yeah. 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 So, So what I, I also felt that um, they can be passionate about certain aspects of things without being passionate about the rest. And why should a child have to handle, let's say, the business side of their music career <laughs> mm -hmm. um, just because they love making music when we would not even do that to an adult? Um, if yeah. most adults had the choice, they would delegate <laughs> a good portion of their, you know, of their career to others, the parts that, that are not their strengths possibly, or that they're not ready for. Um, so it just seemed kind of like an obvious thing for me at the time. Um, and what I did learn was that I actually, I really love supporting other people's passions. Um, it's a passion of mine. <laughs> so it, well, it just, I, I really enjoy doing it. I love looking for solutions. I love looking for, um, you know, possibilities and opportunities to try things. Um, with, I'm trying to think of decent examples, but um, for Sawyer with his music, um, you know, I mean, it was clear that music was a passion and a talent for him, but more importantly, it was something that he loved doing um, and he simply loved to sing. Um, so for me, it was, well, how can I, Gosh, I don't know how to explain it now. Um, like he struggled most with like some insecurities at first that that his singing wasn't good enough, that his uh, guitar playing wasn't good enough. And he had a hard time seeing his his own abilities, I think, or or trusting in them. And so that was where I focused my work was trying to 
surround him in a supportive environment with people that um, that helped him see that he was actually a really good singer and that people wanted to hear him sing um, and that and that when he did sing for others, it had an amazing effect on them. And, uh, you know, so it took him a while to come out. I, I feel like I'm just not hitting this question right at all. But I think that is, uh, that is such a great point though, that you like, you, there was so much in there that, that I would grab onto because <laughs> there is that point of, of creating that environment for them, but that, <clears throat> you can't to expect that we can tell our kids that they're good at something, right? Right. It, it's something that they need to come to on their own. Like, and that's the other point too. I think when you're living in the real world, you have your own, everybody has their own um, maybe expectations of themselves, their own goals their own aspirations, mm -hmm. right? And I remember even having this conversation around reading, you know, that a lot of unschooled kids don't go around saying I can read until they're reading like adult level books because that's just reading in the world, right? It, right. It's not I can read because I can read this grade one reader who that has a certain set of, of words, vocabulary that it draws from, et cetera, right? So mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a whole different thing and, and it's about supporting them and helping them explore. Like when, when you're talking about these anxieties, you're, you're helping them um, explore their passion or their interest or what it is that they're interested in doing in a safe right. environment so that they can keep exploring it because it's what they want to do, even if they're uncomfortable about aspects, even if they don't, you know, in their eyes, um, think they're good or, you know, I, I can see why you're struggling with those, the words, it, it is hard to explain, right, right. but, but it is such a, such a, such a different way to approach it, isn't it? It's an understanding that, okay, I don't need to, I don't need to convince you that you're good at these things so that you can not be anxious or you can relax and just do them. No, it's about yeah. continuing to create an environment for them where they're comfortable and doing all those other things. Like I remember many years ago, you and I connected over this because I was helping Lissy with her photography, right? And, yeah. and you were helping Sawyer with his music and, and stuff. And we were connecting over the fact that there were lots of different aspects that we enjoyed handling for them to create yeah. an environment where they could dive into the stuff that they loved. Cause you had a great point that adults, if there's stuff that we don't like doing, but we want to have done, we, you know, we hire people to do that for them or we ask yep. other people to help. Like, why is it bad for a child to ask their parent to help them with aspects X and Y because they don't enjoy them, yeah. but they want to get there. They want to do this thing, but they don't want to do this little thing over here. It's okay for them to ask their parents. You know, it's again, yeah. like, why would it be okay for an adult, but not okay for a kid to ask for yeah. that help, right? Yeah. And, and it goes with have to. There's this mentality that I'm not teaching him about the entire reality of being a musician for the rest of his life if I don't show him the struggles of booking shows or whatever. <laughs> yeah. like, 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 no, you meet them where they're at right then. And so like at that point for him, it was, all right, can I take a video of you um, singing this song that you're, you're playing in the kitchen? And it was okay, but only with the lights off. Mm -hmm. And so then to play that back for him and he's like, that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then get his permission to put it on YouTube and get feedback from our friends and family. Cause it wasn't like he was, you know, famous or anything. So that feedback at the time, it encouraged him mm -hmm. to go further. Um, and if it hadn't, that was okay too. Exactly. <laughs> right. Right. So You're just like helping like, them explore oh, it thing you know I did the right thing and I cured him of his anxiety no I tried no. something yeah 
Yeah, yeah, and exactly. It happened, <laughs> it happened <laughs> to take us in the right direction or that was right for him. And, and, and the feedback from that would have helped you take another step, whether it was in the same direction or a little bit, a little bit different, a little bit. That's what we, when we talk about facilitating and exploring interests and passions, you know, whatever yeah. you call them, um, that's kind of what, what we're talking about, right? It's not like we have a set end goal in mind and we're trying I to never, help them get to that end goal. End. Like, oh, I have this agenda that. Exactly. Well, he likes to sing. Well, that locks him in. He has to be a musician and a singer and a, <laughs> and a performer, and, you know, because, because he's whatever he was at the time, 11. And <laughs> so it, it, it looks like we, we did this amazing path looking back and we did, it was awesome, but the path wasn't foreordained. It wasn't like, <laughs> exactly no yeah. that's it that's what i love is you can that's the an amazing thing about unschooling is when you look back you can see the thread and the path to where you got to like where you are right yeah. now you can see how you got there but you can't look forward right in no. it you other than in this moment you know in this moment and you know what are my my aspirations my goals right now because they help you right. They just help inform what direction you're going to take that very next step. Because then yeah. you learn something new and you're in a whole new place and, and that self-awareness is right there. And, and that helps you take that next step in whatever direction. I think mean, that's another thing too is, is that's part of our de-schooling, right? Is yeah. to not um, take on those things as kind of as our own like so often we talked about lots on the podcast about how if our child's interested in something we can all of a sudden get all excited about it and kind of take it over with our energy and where we think it should go right so it's part of that processing to completely um, be able to separate ourselves and realize we are just helping them it's got nothing to do with um yeah. how we see ourselves as a parent or how, you know, we feel judged by other people around us, et cetera, because, you know, and, and that's not, that's not an easy one to do you, because no, parents no, often are I'm like, oh, I've I've always done that perfectly, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. It, it's hard not to be start to become vested personally. Yep. In, in these activities because they become your own passions. Yeah, and it so it is. Um, it yeah, like I still follow him, but yes, if he decided, okay, I'm not going to perform anymore, and I'm not this. I'm done. I'm done with this whole thing. This yeah. life isn't for me. I would need to process that for myself because mm -hmm. it has become so much part of my life. That doesn't mean I would judge him or. No, stop making that any way, right? <laughs> but, but to be completely honest, it would be a, a, a something that I would have to move through on my own as well, you know. Absolutely, yeah. and and that's the thing about well, I mean, we're calling it unschooling. It's it's a it's a way of life now, right? Yeah, is is that as things are always going to grow and change, and we always need to process and 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 figure out where we sit in in everything yeah. you know those those will be big changes and you know um i suspect that because we're aware it it probably would not be a uh, like 90 degree like angle change you would probably get some kind of clues along the way that he was starting to yeah. you know you know same with with any of our children's interests, our, our husbands, you know, good friends, whatever, people that you are strongly connected to, you're going to get these clues when people are starting to like lose interest or not being happy yeah. with those kind of directions. And we're not going to be probably so blindsided by, you know, big turns. Absolutely. We're going to see little steps along the way. Right. And because that has been become a, a you know a habit a life skill for yeah. for all of us that 
to kind of keep taking stock in where we're at and whether, whether, you know, is everything okay? Are there certain aspects of my life right now that I, I could change and, and would make things just a little better? Yeah. Um, or, um, you know, uh, little things like being Sawyer's manager, um, we've had to gauge his time, his, you know, his off time, mm -hmm. um, in, in the sense that like, I, I, I used to be like, I'd just get excited about something that had come up in an email and I would just walk up to him wherever he was and be like, Hey, guess what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was hurting things actually, because he didn't have necessarily the same excitement about the same kinds of things. Yeah. First of all. Um, but also I was interrupting his off time and it literally his manager lived in his house mm -hmm. and could just find him in any room. <laughs> <laughs> so, like that's so, so we, you know, we were like, okay, well that's not working. So then yeah. it was like, okay, well, if it's work related, text me. Okay. So, but then we discovered, you know what? Like, so we tried that for a while and it was like, you know, texting is still a bit intrusive. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So it was like, okay. All right. So anything that can wait, you email. And then if there's something urgent, you say, Hey, I need you to check this out. It, you know, within the next hour, if you, when you have a chance mm -hmm. and go check your emails or whatever it was. And so there, these are just little ways that we've tried to modify, you know, tried to figure out a way to make, to make it work for everybody, right? To make it work for everyone because I'm also his mom. So there, yeah. there's, you know, the, the, the relationships, um, sometimes didn't work well together. Yeah. You know, the manager relationship and the mom relationship. Um, so, but yeah, and, and no, those still, are the conversations that you have, right? It's like, yep. you know, cause it comes up cause you're living together, right? <laughs> and you're looking for them. You're looking for, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm paying attention to yeah. he's not happy. You know what I mean? And so I don't think we'd ever get to the point where he'd be like completely out of the blue. I'm quitting music or something like, like that, for example. Yeah. Because there would be so many little, little steps. steps. Exactly. It, 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 and frankly, like, I feel like he would work on, like that, he wouldn't jump to that the way someone else would, like, maybe if they felt so trapped in a situation that mm -hmm. they had to give up everything in order to. To make to a change. Be happy. Yeah. yeah. I don't think he would come to that conclusion. Like, he, yeah. he knows. He's not trapped. Exactly. That is such a great point, you know, because so often when people feel the need, they, they have to make a big change. It's because, you know, they, they have exactly, they felt trapped where they are and they don't yeah. see any way out except to like blow everything up and start again. <laughs> <Right>? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. All right. All right. Yeah. So what has surprised you most about how unschooling has unfolded in your lives? Um, I think, <clears throat> I mean, there's, there's a number of things, but I, I feel like one of the biggest surprises was how much it, it helped my husband and I in our life choices. Mm -hmm. Um, like we, it, it, going into it, it was all about, well, we're doing this for the kids and this is about their but see, the problem with that is thinking that this is during their schooling years. Yeah. So realize that unschooling is just living. <laughs> that it's that it's not just during the school years or whatever. You know, like well, anyways, it, we just found that the principles of it related to us as well, which was a surprise because we thought of it this is this is a an education thing and we're not in school anymore. <laughs> so. <laughs> But I mean, even just moving to the farm, um, that was, you know, just a, a couple of years after uh, we had started unschooling and 
applying the principles of unschooling, of following your passions and addressing issues where you're not happy um, was really what brought us here. It, you know, Carl was struggling and it, to realize that I could give him the same gift, that we could give ourselves the same gift that we were doing for our children and that it applied to everyone. <laughs> Um, so that, that, um, I think that was a huge surprise at the time. That's so, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we did the same thing. We ended up moving a couple years after we started <laughs> unschooling as well, because I don't know what it is, but it's like, you just discover you have so much more choice in your life than you thought. You, you realize you have choices and nothing mm -hmm. is have to. Yeah, I know, right? I, that whole have to thing. I, I learned <laughs> to rebel against that. And as soon as someone would say, I have to, in a like, oh, you know, lamenting sort of way, it would be like, well, wait a minute. W wait, do you? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Exactly. Like, wait, wait, no, we don't have to. How <laughs> can we make it? work so that you don't have to <laughs> <laughs> no yeah it just it just opens up the whole world okay so can you talk about your journey from control to trust in your relationships with your children because I think this is a big one for people you know it's challenging because it's so against what we grew up with right when things became right. hard we reach for more control. Our parents reach for more control. It's the tool that we know whenever we're feeling a little uh, afraid or worried or anything, okay, we need to get things more under control, more under control. So that journey to trust can be a challenge. Yeah. And it definitely, um, it definitely was a challenge and it's not a constant challenge. It just kind of rears its head every once in a while. <laughs> Um, in those moments, like, right? <laughs> like through the journey, there, there's, I, I'm trying to come up with, like, think of an example, but um, it usually has to do with fear and yeah. trust. And this idea that, you know, what I don't like about what's happening right now is always, always, always going to be that way. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And and getting stuck in that fear, um, you know, and forgetting to trust. So most of the time, when when I would get in those types of situations where I found myself asserting, you know, more control than people were happy with, like it. it, it there's usually a pretty clear reaction that, <laughs> that this isn't working. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, so I might have tried something that was, you know, kind of a, a you know, knee jerk reaction or something that was an old tool mm -hmm. that just because in the moment I just couldn't think of anything else or something like that. Um, and it, the thing was, it never really worked. So most of those times we basically needed to step back from the moment and I would talk to friends. I would talk to you. I would talk to other people in our um, unschooling groups. Um, and because I, sometimes I would find myself stuck mm -hmm. and not able to see it from the, my child's perspective, as much as I thought I knew their perspective and as much as I thought I'd, you know, progressed, <laughs> I would still get stuck in something um, and it almost always helped first of all to to ask other unschoolers because we've all been through it and it was amazing to me just how people could help explain a perspective um, that I was like oh <laughs> I hadn't thought oh. of that <laughs> yeah and and you know, once you hear, once you hear it, like what is right for you, you recognize it. Mm -hmm. And then it, it, oh, okay. That, that feels true to me. That feels right. And then we would try that. Um, 
And another thing was, I mean, one of our struggles um, when the kids were younger um, was just sibling conflict, um, just fighting, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, arguments over different things, uh, gaming, just you name it. I mean, there, yeah. are, there are three, three young boys close in age and yeah. So, um, and sometimes like, even though I could get to the point where, okay, no one's hurting each other anymore. We're good there. And everyone's, you know, doing their own thing and trying to calm down, but we're still mad and we haven't found a solution. And it feels like we never, ever, ever will. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would, you know, just, I, I would sometimes I'd just be outside, you know, I just kind of take, remove myself from the moment and remind myself that every other times I've been in this position where it felt like there was no answer, just wait mm -hmm. and it, it will come. And just to have faith that their solutions will present themselves. Um, and I think just believing that, and that's where the trust is, right? So like just believing that a solution would come about allowed me to see them, to allowed us to see the solutions, allowed everyone to say, okay, well, you know, we figured out something that, that is going to work um, for now. That was also another really easy thing for us was to be like, well, this might not be the perfect solution, but it's the closest we can think of right now. So let's do this one now. And we all agree that if it still doesn't work, we're back to talking about it. And and that just kind of said, hey, we're all still listening and everybody's opinion is, is valid and important. And it's, I, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I love that. <laughs> that. I do. Yeah. The, the piece, that, that is the whole thing about trust. I, that was something that helped me too, was remembering previous times when yep. it worked out. And I could always tell later, you know, the looking back thing <laughs> when I was holding right. on really tight to something because it was always when is that last, it's like, I can't wait any longer. Yeah. And it yeah. was always like, just, just beyond that. I just had to wait that, that extra time. It was like, but I, you know, I, I can't wait any longer, but I couldn't think of what to do. And then so often the next moment, you know, the next couple of days right. or something, it just like came. So that exactly. was that patience, that trust. It's like, even if I can't see a way forward in my yep. experience, you know, so the first few times you're kind of, we talked about this a few episodes ago, I think buying, buying confidence or trust from other people, mm -hmm. you know, cause when you're first learning about unschooling and people tell you these things, it's like, okay, that sounds good, but you don't have the personal experience, right? So at first you're kind of doing some things or trying some things out because you've heard that good things right. happen, right? <laughs> but then yeah. you, after a while, you gain that experience yourself, right? And then it's remembering those moments. It's like, I try to remember, okay, remember how you saw no way forward yet you were able to wait a bit, relax, chat with everybody. And they came up with this super cool way that I couldn't have even thought of if I, you know, tried to control yeah. them and tried to tell them what to do. This is even better. Like it's not a replacement one way or the other. And okay, I won't control them. No, this actually gets us better places in the end. This right. trust and this working together and remembering that and remembering that and then using that as my trust each time as we move forward when we came into these situations because you know we talked so much about how you don't choose unschooling because you think you're going to get a perfect life or, you know because when you're first reading about it it kind of sounds like a perfect life right because of where you are right now right where we found ourselves yeah, looking at the back. this was so much better looking back <laughs> this yeah. is really life but that's the great thing is that these are not obstacles that we're putting in our own path. Now it's just life and navigating life and our growing self-awareness yeah. and really understanding how much choice we have in our lives. It's like a whole, it becomes a whole lifestyle, yes. doesn't it? <laughs> it does. It really does. And another part of the whole control thing, yeah. um, I was coming from, you know, with 
boys were coming from a public school system that behavior modification mm -hmm. was def definitely everything like that that it was rewarding and punishing so it was you know you you reward the behaviors you want to see punish the ones you you don't want to see and what i learned was oh shoot i'm losing it because i really <laughs> want to talk about this darn um control okay. behavior modification control and behavior mod <laughs> um, oh okay so for example i learned like early on that what other people would see as rewarding poor behavior for me was no we are shifting to a place where everyone can come down from the the challenges and the crisis and the pain of what we were just going through so let, let's say there was a big argument and one kid broke another kid's toy just really random yep and Okay, so everyone is furious at everyone. Everyone's upset. The one who broke it was upset for whatever he was upset about. And the one who's got their toy broke is, is miserable. And I don't have a solution right now, right in this moment. And everybody's too mad to even think about it. So I often would change gears and literally just look for something that was like, all right, well, right now, this sucks let's do something else for a little bit. Like maybe it was watch a favorite show or go outside, be around water. I, you know, depending on the age, whatever it was mm -hmm. that I knew was a, a really neutral, positive environment that we could shift to. Mm -hmm. um, and then come back to it later and say, Hey, yeah. So everyone's feeling better now, but earlier today, you know, Skylar broke Eric's toy. Um, and we should talk about why he was upset, but we also need to talk about Eric really feels it's unfair that Skylar broke his toy and what can Skylar do to offer a kind of restitution for it? Like that was usually how we approached things like that. It wasn't like punishment. It was, and I left it up to them to really come up with what was considered fair, <laughs> you know? Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's another, that fair piece is something that was a big aha, aha moment for me because how I would, it wasn't my situation, right? And how I would think of fair to resolve it was, was irrelevant, really. Like, because growing up, so much of it was fair was equal, yeah. which really, which really isn't fair <laughs> because or, they're all different people even, sure if they were all robots equal would be fair you know but it's right. to them what feels be. fair to them right and so right. that's why help supporting them just helping them figure out what works for them to move through a situation is so much more valuable right and i think it also remembering that for for us adding punishment instead of restitution simply added to the trauma mm -hmm. of it all to an extent um and even for like eric certainly didn't want not once he'd calmed down he didn't want to see me go and break skylar's toy <laughs> <laughs> to now okay now you're equal <laughs> you know like doing or, or worse, if, you know, if a family said, well, the punishment is, you know, we're going to spank you or, or it's a timeout or you've lost your privilege to do X, Y, Z now, you know, um, it, it doesn't solve the problem. One isn't related to the other at all. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so what we were raised with, with what was considered, you know, completely normal, perfectly good parenting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there was, uh, one day when Skylar was still in school and he'd had a meltdown during the day. Um, and it was a hard day for him. And, you know, I, he ended up coming home half the day. Um, and he had soccer that evening. Loves soccer. Loves, loves, loves soccer. 
And the school psychologist at the time questioned my choice to still take him to soccer because she felt I was rewarding the poor yep. behavior in school. And I, and that is such a common perspective. And I was like, no, I'm recognizing that poor behavior was coming from a very difficult, horrible experience for him as well. <laughs> or what, what they called poor behavior, you know, yeah. um, it was, he was having an awful day. Why should I make more of his day awful? <laughs> so, right. and I, it, it just, the whole concept of, of punishment and, and not, you know, meanwhile, like, how would that help? Mm -hmm. All right, now you can't go to soccer. All right, now I have a kid that's dealing with even more disappointment, who's had a horrible day, doesn't address the issues at all that caused his horrible day. Mm -hmm. Now you know, <laughs> right? Something that could make his day better. <laughs> like, I, I don't understand it, but, but it was, that is the normal reaction to struggles you know, I know. For, for just children. pile on more struggles you're struggling with something yeah. let's, let's like make it worse let's make it worse it's like i don't know just make it so bad yeah. that that you just don't want to you know it's so that they won't act that way but again even, but it's because they, they can't act happiness. <laughs> yeah <laughs> you don't deserve to be happy this evening so, you know, I think yeah. you're not worthy of it. Like, what message am I am I handing him? Yeah. No, that's <laughs> I, I <great>. don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, we should move on then. What yeah. have you come to value most about your unschooling lifestyle over the years? Um. Gosh, I mean, we've talked about so much of it, really. Yeah. But, um. Uh, number one my relationships with mm -hmm. my kids absolutely like that's just the the connection that's there um that that feels so authentic and comfortable and and good so that that's huge um and then everything that it's taught me um Gosh, you know, ab about the choices I have in life and, and how much more freedom is really there than, than I might have thought. Um, and how, you know, how these choices and solutions apply to every aspect of our lives. So, but I, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's everything. It is, it, it is our way of life now. Like, I don't think of it as unschooling as much anymore yeah you know uh, just because it's it is living this is what we do yeah this is how we live our life and speaking of which yeah. that leads greatly into the next question here so as our children get older talking about more conventional messages <laughs> yeah the conventional message is loud and clear that kids need to move out of the house to prove that they aren't failures at life right this is like okay but will they ever you know um yeah. and you have older kids living in your family home and i do too yeah. and they are definitely not failing at life by any stretch of the imagination so oh i God. just thought i'd ask your thoughts around that one yeah no um first of all i think that the whole pressure to move out is a huge societal, you know, invention <laughs> mm -hmm. that, um, I, you know, to get real political, I think it's just, it's consumerism, it's capitalism, it's this concept that, that we need to sell more houses and everyone needs their own washing machine. <laughs> and like, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, may, maybe it's because we've been kind of in a, a little bit of a recession for a while now that that I, I see the value, even from a practical sense of being home, having everyone home and having a, an extended family within the home. Um, and I, I feel like it's nothing new either. This is, this is a very 
this is a much older way of living. Um, it makes total sense on a farm. Lord <laughs> knows, having four grown, <laughs> you know, young adults at home is a huge, huge help. So I mean, I don't, I, I don't in any way resent them being home. Um, like not even the tiniest bit. Like, no. If anything, they're doing me a favor. <laughs> but, um, but also. I love, I love having them. And we don't, we just don't even think of it that way. Um, I, if, you know, Sawyer, I think is looking at an apartment right now or looking at apartments. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, oh my gosh, okay, wow. All right. But I'm not like, it's gonna be kind of, you know, an adjustment for me as a mom, but not in the sense that, oh, that's a mistake or, or oh, look, he's, He's making a more mature, I'm not comparing like, okay, so he's moving out, but Skylar and Eric are staying and he's the youngest. It doesn't make him more successful. It's simply that, frankly, right now he's got a girlfriend and our house isn't really structured that well for privacy. And <laughs> I don't, you know, it's, it's, it, it, they're all very like logistical decisions and not just, um, you know, like this principle of what magic age you need to be independent. Exactly. So. You know, I think that's the thing is these are real choices, right? Yeah. They're not because I'm expected to do this. They're not expectations that I have to prove or I have to do something or, or anybody has or an expectation. Next step that I'm it's supposed just, to take like college or whatever it is. That, yeah. You know, that society has said, this is, you know, like, so he gets that all the time from you know some of his older fans don't forget school when are you going to college and i'm just I, it just cracks us up every single time because like well, he might choose to take classes or, or learn a lot more in a certain area at some point but are you actually questioning his choices right now <laughs> and the amount of learning and the value and what he's doing right now that this this is his education. He, this is it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's no, doing I know. it. <laughs> <laughs> but if we phrase it differently, when we say, "Oh, well, he's doing an internship," or <laughs> you know, you. Well, <laughs> yeah, you know. Program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I remember um, at first because. That was it. It was it was a real choice and a good choice for Lissy. Like she basically moved out when she was eighteen, right? And she moved to another mm -hmm. country for crying out loud. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you know, that's how we ended up kind of phrasing it too for the more um, conventionally minded around us. It was, yeah. you know, instead of paying for college, you know, using that money for a visa so that she can go, she's still learning. You know, we did that intern comparison, right? right. It, yeah, you, you it was have to justify it to some people, but yeah. for us, it's so ingrained that, you know, we can just laugh at the absurdity of it. Exactly. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we all knew what, you know, great thing it, it was for her, it, you know, it wasn't a choice between one or, it was a choice between them only in that they have the choice to do what they want to do, right? Exactly. And exactly. they know that choice is there, but, you know, this is where um, they're fully engaged right now. This is what they're enjoying. And when they're enjoying it, that's when they're learning so much about it. And, and, you know, but yeah, you can't, back to what we were saying earlier you can't convince other people and nope. and then you you eventually come to realize that the need to convince other people is your issue to deal with <laughs> yep. but you can yep. you can frame things for other people so they understand them so you know there's nothing wrong with making that intern comparison for them because it gets them to the same comfortable place that we are you know and right. it's just through right. the lens that they understand things right it yeah. still gets it's, it's still true it's just yeah. a different language it's a different yeah. way of seeing so exactly yeah. okay question number 10 kirsten <laughs> oh boy looking back what for you has been the most valuable outcome from choosing unschooling 
as a lifestyle and continuing to live that lifestyle now. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it, um, it, it really like for me personally, yeah. Um, I think that it has helped me with, um, a number of things that like I have, I am prone to anxiety. Um, and anxiety is very often, it, it's partly a, just a, you know, an, an emotional thing that affects you. But um, the reassurance that there, there will always be, you know, a choice and there will always, and I, and I, and I need to learn more about this, but then I, I'm sure if I learn more about it, I will find the solution. And, and also the, the trust in letting, letting things be for a little while, just even identifying, seeing the value of identifying the problem and letting it be like, okay, well, I've identified it. Now I can take a break. <laughs> that was hard. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> but, but, you know like little little stages of you know and and it really trust is the biggest word it's the the biggest thing that i've learned from from unschooling um and you know whenever i'm i do find myself really struggling sometimes i can get back to that place by myself but I have a really great group of friends that know <laughs> they just say, Oh yeah. So, so you need to trust, right? And I'll be like, Oh, Oh, oh yeah, oh. that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's not saying I'm going to trust that all of this will be made better for me magically. Yeah. I'm trusting, I'm trusting that, that there certain people will come into my life little situations i'm gonna catch something on facebook that that connects with what i'm going through there things you know i i'm i trust my ability to do research um i, I and to listen to my gut about you know what is right for me so i think that's yeah. A huge thing and you know my kids do it. It, it, it it's beautiful to watch them because they are so they they know themselves so well and they don't have these kinds of doubts that I am prone to yeah. <laughs> um, I love that I love that piece that yeah. because we always I, I mean, I've noticed that too. And it's like, I always feel a pressure that I need to solve something quick. Right. And, yeah. and remembering, like looking at my kids and, and seeing, oh, we can trust, trust this and give it time, the time that it needs. Right. right. It doesn't need to be, you know, because for me, that's where the fear and the worry comes in. It's like, oh, I need, I need this solution. I need to get to hear, you know, I need to solve this right. by X time. And, you know, to be able to sit with that discomfort right. and trust that things, you know, I used to say, trust, there's, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, even if I can't see it yet. But now right. when I'm remind, when, you know, when I'm stuck in worry and swirling, it's like, oh, I can trust that there's a light there, even when I don't see it right now. I love that. That's Absolutely. such a, that's such a great piece. And, and I really, I love seeing that my kids have gotten to that point too, because they, it's just so fun to watch them, isn't it? Just to, they don't get so stressed and worked up about. They, so they really things. don't. Things are very much in the moment. Um, they, it, it, it's amazing. Like, uh, I was, yeah, I'm blanking now, and I just had like an example I wanted to share. But, but <laughs> okay, yeah, that's yeah. that's how my brain. But um, yeah. Trust is awesome, and it trust is awesome. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You know, they, 
so many questions that they've gotten or, you know, what are your plans for this or what are your plans for that? Or, you know, people will ask Sawyer, you know, well, funny one was, or, are you, you know, so, so do you want to do music as a career? And this was like, like, while he literally was earning money <laughs> doing music, <laughs> but because he was young, it, it didn't count as, career yet or something I don't really know what it was it was yeah. like well well he is no he actually is doing that now now is he gonna want to do it later <laughs> and the thing is Sawyer would always be like I don't know I, I'm I he would say I always I'm sure I'll always have music being a part of my life but I'm not worried about whether it's my career or not um it, mm -hmm. because there's other ways to make money there's other things I'll enjoy doing, yeah. but music will always be there, you know? And, but the thing is he, he, that would be the answer he would give. But the truth was, it was, it was more like, why, why do I need to know that? Why do yeah. I need to know that now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why do I need to presuppose what the next 40 years of my life is going to be? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> That, that's a strange question. I'm, this is what I'm doing now. Isn't that what matters? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me today, Kirsten. It was so much fun. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for asking me to do this. It was really, um, it was, it was fun to look back through the, you know, the years and the progress and the journey. That's really, I cool. know. Right. Cause yeah, I bet for years it's just been living life. Right. So to think back on on how you got through unschooling that's uh that's a bit different <laughs> it's it's a really great reminder of you know the choices I'm, I'm just really happy about the choices we made so oh that's awesome thanks so much and have a wonderful day you too thank you <laughs>